Hello! Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Sullivan, and you have joined us for another free brain health lecture. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on Parkinson's disease again. This is the third in a series of lectures that have focused on this movement disorder. We have had so many new friends join us in the last week. It's been absolutely amazing. It's really proven to me that this idea of bringing brain health directly to people in their homes for free uh, was a good idea. I think that so many of you out there really seek a uh, trustworthy resource for finding out about the brain and what you should be doing, but it's just really hard to know who am I supposed to be trusting because it seems like so many people out there have a product to sell me at the end of the talk. So what I try to do is bring you free brain health information brought to you by an expert, a board certified neuropsychologist that is a succinct review of a certain um, topic, but we always conclude with evidence-based recommendations about how you can turn that learning into action. I started this program a couple years ago and began it locally in my community doing a series of talks in retirement communities. And what I decided to do starting in October of this year was to bring it to Facebook. So we're almost at a thousand likes. Our last video had about 30,000 people check it out, which is just totally mind blowing. And maybe the best part has been how many people from all around the world had a chance to watch it. So we've got new friends in India and Uruguay and Brazil and uh, Canada and Scotland. And it's just been so cool to have this community of people gather here every Wednesday night. What I'm really trying to do is to create an empowerment movement within brain health. And I was inspired by two things that I kept noticing a lot in my job as a neuropsychologist. The first one was how many bad brain health products there are on the market. There's so many promises out there that are really, really expensive, really suck up your time and your hope, and there's just no return on the investment. The brain fitness industry is an eight to $10 billion industry, and there's not one product that I can think of that is kind of a common over-the-counter, like a, a supplement or a brain game that I, in good conscience, would recommend to my patients. But yet, there's this whole world of scientific information that's written about in brain health journals that brain scientists and brain doctors know genuinely help. And the coolest part is that so many of these recommendations are completely free or low cost. So that really inspired me to want to bring that information to you and close that gap. The other thing is that I feel really strongly that patients, people who have brain health challenges, really need and deserve more knowledge and more information. I wonder how many of you out there watching feel like when you go to your brain health specialist that you don't walk away with a rich knowledge base of exactly what's going on to you, what you can expect. I think that there's so many pressures on medical providers nowadays to um, honestly jam as many patients as they can into a schedule that providers are just really, really strapped for time. I think a lot of people go into medicine and uh, behavioral health because they genuinely want to care, but you can kind of get caught up in these systems and you're being pressured and evaluated to basically see volume. And we can, we've kind of lost our way, I think, about really spending that time one-on-one -on -one to share our knowledge with people. The other thing is that I think so many people have brain health issues that really don't understand them. So a perfect example is stroke. I see a lot of people um, in my practice who have had MRIs. And so I'll read the MRI and I always wanna make sure that I go through the results with them. And I, I cannot tell you how many times I'll say, so you understand that you've had a stroke and it's completely brand new information to that person. Or yeah, I know I had a stroke, but they have no idea where it happened in their brain, no idea at all how this relates to cognition, mood, behavior, and they're basically left with an extra layer 
of suffering because of this lack of knowledge. So my interest, my dedication is in trying to solve these two problems. Uh, my mom has taught me a lot of very important things and one of them is to not be a complainer. That if you identify a problem, that it is your responsibility to offer a solution. So that is how we are together tonight. So what we're gonna do is circle back around to uh, Parkinson's disease. So let me provide a brief overview for some of you who uh, maybe haven't been with us before, but we know that it's a chronic and a progressive neurodegenerative movement disorder that is characterized by motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. In the motor symptoms, we typically see a unilateral tremor, which means it happens on one side, rigidity, which is a stiffness of the muscles, more difficulty moving, um, something called cogwheel rigidity, which is basically if you move a big joint, we specifically think about it in the shoulder with Parkinson's, but basically you can almost feel like a cog, like chick, 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 chick. The joints just don't move smoothly. Many things in PD get smaller, so people's posture gets a little bit smaller, their voice can get a little bit smaller, their handwriting can get a little bit smaller, but there's also these non-motor symptoms, which are the autonomic changes, which are blood pressures that go up and down much too quickly, um, things like um, loss of smell, trouble with retrieval, depression, anxiety. If you're interested in those things, please check out our very first lecture where we talked about those non-motor symptoms. And we know that Parkinson's is caused by a reduction in the dopamine producing neurons that are in different parts of the brain. Only about 10% of people with Parkinson's have a known genetic mutation. So this leaves us with 90% of people who have PD that are thought to have both genetic variants, which is some family history, um, some predisposition to developing Parkinson's, but something in the environment turns on that gene, which is how they wind up having the clinical disorder of Parkinson's disease. The chemical exposure that we're gonna talk about tonight has been the topic of a lot of research in the last 20 to 30 years, and there's definitely strides that have been made, but we do not have the answers. My job is to try to help you understand the state of the literature as it is today. And what I really care about is how can you use this information to protect yourself or your family or improve your quality of life today. So why is this topic important? Why did I choose it as uh, the focus of one of our lectures? Well, the first thing is it represents a modifiable risk factor, and that's really what the I Care For Your Brain program is. I'm trying to help you understand what are the risk factors that you have control over, and what are the protective things that you can do that will reduce the likelihood of you getting something like dementia, like Parkinson's disease, that you may have a genetic susceptibility to get because of your family history. The other thing is that I feel that this information would help me, if I was living with PD, have a better sense of control about the why. Why did this happen to me? One of the ways that I work as a neuropsychologist is to never put myself in the role of the only expert in the room. I feel really strongly that my patients and their family are the experts in them. Hopefully I have some expertise due to these wonderful schools that I've gone to and going through all my education and my examinations and the thousands of patients that I've seen, but I feel really strongly about a collaborative approach. So when I ask my people about having PD, a lot of people, especially the younger onset folks, really want to know what ha what was I exposed to? What happened? Because we know that there is something with these chemicals that's going on with PD, but very few people have actually gone through the literature and tried to figure it out. So to me, one of the things as a psychologist that I really care about is increasing people's quality of life and their well-being. And the way I would feel is that I want information. So to me, this is a very important reason to do this topic. The other one is this is a public health issue. I don't care if you have PD or don't have, um, this is a public health issue, okay? This is important to you whether or not you have PD or not. I knew a fair amount before I started to do the research for our time together tonight, but I have to tell you, I have been pretty disturbed by the things that I've been learning. Um, the chemical exposures that we all are 
um, exposed to on a daily basis are truly, truly scary. And it's really something that we need to change as a, a world. It's, it's really pretty frightening. So most brain disorders that we know, including PD, are of course very complex and they really are an interplay between genetic factors and environmental factors. But what I want you to know is that most brain disorders connection one more time. Okay, here we are again. Most Okay, excellent. Um, in the case of Parkinson's disease, um, 50 to 60% of the dopaminergic neurons in the brain have to be lost before you start to see the clinical signs, okay? And that can take decades. So what's important from that is that you appreciate this difference between structure and function. And that's something I talk about a lot when we talk about understanding the brain. So the brain can have a lot of things going on on a structural, physiological level that really don't get expressed clinically or in someone's everyday life, okay? so. Um, we talked about this as it relates to Alzheimer's disease, which is really, really uh, an important concept and how we got to something called cognitive reserve, which is basically there was a series of autopsy studies and they looked in the brains of people who had donated their brain to science and a proportion of people had Alzheimer's disease on autopsy in their brains. You look at under a microscope and you see the plaques and tangles, but they didn't have Alzheimer's disease in real life because Alzheimer's disease is symptoms that are expressed, okay? So what you see in the brain and what's happening in the brain isn't necessarily what's happening in real life and this is one thing that I really want you to know because many people overestimate the power of neuroimaging things like MRIs, CT scans of the brain these things are critical but you have to remember it's not the whole picture okay especially when it comes to things like dementia so what I really um, want us to focus on tonight is you know, the bottom line is that there hasn't been one compound um, that has been specifically associated with the onset of Parkinson's disease, but there are certainly a lot of um, factors for us to think about, and there's certainly a lot of chemical classes that we need to think through. So what we're going to think about tonight are pesticides, solvents, metals and something called PCBs, okay? I hope you can appreciate that the literature is huge. I did my best to try to think through useful bits of information and things that would be very informative to you, but there's no way I could possibly cover it all, okay? So how did this um, topic uh, become a focus of scientists? Well, the first thing to note is that we know that PD has been around for a very, very long time. But since the Industrial Revolution, the incidence of PD have increased dramatically. So that was our first clue that agents in the environment were responsible for mixing together somehow with our genes to result in Parkinson's disease. Now we know that it's not all an environmental factor. Um, and like I said, 90% of people, it's definitely not just your genes. So it's this interaction between the two that we're trying to understand. So this conversation really got started in the 1980s. And it got started because of um, some researchers in Northern California who were researching people who were taking synthetic heroin who started to develop a Parkinsonian symptom disorder. And it wasn't Parkinson's disease, but it looked like it, it walked like it, it talked like it. And the idea was that they found that there was a chemical contaminant in the heroin called MT, MPTP. Um, and the idea is that it entered the brain through you know using of the IV needles and basically sparked off a process in the brain that is very similar to Parkinson's disease and this was very important because it really got people to think that okay wow we could be putting something in our bodies that was making people who were genetically predisposed start to develop the disorder the other thing that it did for us in science is that it gave us the first 
inroad to developing an animal model that was very similar to Parkinson's disease. Now that's a very important factor because when we start to talk about why we haven't come up with answers yet about what are these environmental causes, what are these chemicals, it's really um, for four different reasons, but one of them is because we, we don't actually have a perfect animal model of Parkinson's disease yet. And that's really how science happens, is you start with laboratory animals, you move up to higher order animals, and then you get into human studies. If we don't have a mouse model of Parkinson's disease, it's going to be really hard to climb up that ladder to get to the point where we can have a cure or we can understand exactly what environmental agents are causing the genes to turn on. So the studies that have helped us to date are these laboratory animals that are providing us with a pretty good animal model. But there's two other types of studies that most of the research is based on. The first one is epidemiology. And I'll never forget, I think I was 10 years old um, when I declared that I was going to be an epidemiologist. And it's really funny to see where I wound up today because there's a lot of threads of neuropsychology and epidemiology. But basically, it's, it's really a, a curious subspecialty in science because you're trying to understand in large groups of people what has caused an outbreak or what has caused a disease. But these studies are really just looking at associations, okay? We're also looking at self-report, so asking people to reflect back on their exposures and tell you if they've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. These are not perfect, uh, robust research methods because they're not case-controlled studies, um, Self-report is actually kind of a limited research tool because you're just relying on people's memory, which we know is, is fairly faulty. It's also really hard to judge exposure when it comes to chemicals because people use different types of protectants. Sometimes people have worked in places where the supervisors have been really good about wearing really top of the line expensive um, masks and you know eye masks and respirators and all that good stuff. But other places, of course, offer their employees nothing. Thing. Um, some places would like to tell you that they offer employees something, but in reality they don't. So there's just a lot of mud in the water. So that's what's been hard to actually get to the answers of this question. Um, the other thing that I think we have to admit here is that Let's face it, a lot of the things we're gonna talk about tonight are chemicals from chemical companies. And if you don't think that uh, these folks have a lot of lobbying power that then affects who gets federal research dollars, uh, you're sadly mistaken. So of course there's some corporate uh, control going on here. I think we would be foolish not to think that uh, Monsanto, as an example, isn't trying to have researchers closely look at their products to see if they cause Parkinson's disease. So as we get started though, there's two distinctions that you have to understand before we can move on with our conversation. And this is the difference between Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian symptoms, okay? A lot of the research is going to talk to you about Parkinsonian symptoms. This is different than what we call idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That's when you have it or you think of someone who has it, I'm talking to you about idiopathic Parkinson's. Parkinsonian symptoms are Parkinson's disease-like symptoms, so they have generally some kind of tremor, some kind of slowness, some kind of rigidity, some kind of postural instability, but it's not Parkinson's disease because it's not caused by a disruption in dopamine. There's actually something called vascular Parkinson's disease. People can get uh, tremors and rigidity because of drugs. Remember that MTPT that I talked to you about before? And things like illicit drugs, pesticides, solvents. The idea with Parkinsonian symptoms is that you get an acute onset, so as soon as someone is exposed, typically, you're going to get the symptoms, and if you can get them away from the chemical, the symptoms typically get better. Now, of course, if there was damage that was done to the sensitive areas of the brain, then of course someone's going to have a brain injury and go on to live with the consequences of that. But it's really different than Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot of proof in science about what causes Parkinsonian symptoms. But what I'm really trying to do is in my research, I focused on Parkinson's disease. So I want you to understand that difference. Getting that clinical diagnosis right is very important because many people are diagnosed with Parkinsonian symptoms and they may unfortunately think they have Parkinson's disease. So you need, as I said last time, a movement disorder specialist to make this distinction for you. But one 
defining feature is that Parkinson's is almost always on one side of the body, whereas Parkinsonian symptoms tend to be bilateral on both sides of the body, typically the hands. And also you get other symptoms when you have Parkinsonian symptoms like peripheral neuropathy, which you wouldn't typically have as a part of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so the very first thing that happened in the research is they just started to think about the settings of people who had an increased risk of Parkinson's disease, okay? So they thought about people who live in rural settings, farmers, okay? We th talked about veterans, people who were dependent on well water, okay? People who had lived in homes as children that had been fumigated repeatedly, and children who grew up to have Parkinson's who had been exposed to nuts and seeds that have uh, heavy pesticides before the age of 10 years old. So logically, you start to see what are the threads of what those people might have been exposed to, and pesticides is the very first thing. The term pesticides is an umbrella term, and it encapsulates herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and rodenticides. Um, there's hundreds of chemicals that fall under the term pesticides. There are hundreds of different um, chemical structures. They have different biological effects. Um, I read a study that in 2007, there were five billion pounds of pesticides that were used worldwide. I mean, remember what I was saying to you before as I was researching this? I honestly started to get really sick and sad and upset. And I, I really think that we should all be outraged. And as I go on, I, I think you'll, you'll understand why. So we are exposed to pesticides all the time through uh, residue in food, drinking water, but most significantly, people who have an occupational exposure. So this is field workers, people who work in the pesticide industry. Um, in more than 80 populations around the world, there has been proven that there is an association between pesticide exposure and the development of Parkinson's disease. In autopsy studies um, of both animal models and humans, pesticides have been found in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. Of course, many of us are familiar with Agent Orange, which is a defoliant that was used a lot in the Vietnam War. That is a service connectable um, exposure in the VA systems for the development of Parkinson's disease. Um, the first studies really trying to get more specific about pesticide and PD started in like 1985, 1986. And there was some that said, yes, there's an association and some that said no. But the big seminal study that basically got all scientists to agree, this is really a connection here, was um, done from 1993 to 1997. And what they did in North Carolina and Iowa was the agricultural health study was done and they went to um, the government agency where people had to apply for a license in order to be able to use pesticides. And they basically asked people, would you be a part of us following you over the next few years and decades so we can understand what this exposure is doing to you? And a lot of people said yes. And the conclusion that they came to was that um, the more pesticides that you're exposed to, the more likely you are to get Parkinson's. And that's what we call a dose-dependent relationship. And that's really a strong level of evidence in science because it tells you the more someone is exposed to something, the more likely they are to get the problem. And sometimes you don't see that. Um, this is a topic for another day, but all this business about CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy in NFL players this is one of the problems with that data is that the more concussion someone has, they're not more likely to have more CTE. There's some people that have had one concussion, okay? Aaron Hernandez, who unfortunately, well, he, he passed away recently, um, and they looked at his brain and they said he had the worst case of CTE that they had ever seen. Well, if you go look at the records, he's only had one concussion exposure that was known throughout the time in the NFL. So the idea that more exposure results in more problems, it's just kind of a logical leap that when you see that, it's a nice confirmation that we're actually looking at a real finding. So in the world of pesticides, the one that has been most readily identified as being related to PD is Paraquat. And I wanted to spend some time on this because one of the new friends that we have had written to me um, at our last lecture and said she had a husband and his brother who both had PD because they were exposed. 
Um, so it's a commonly used herbicide. It's also been used in military populations similar to Agent Orange as a defoliate. But how they made this leap is kind of interesting. So when you looked at that MPTP, remember I was telling you about the synthetic heroin and people would get the Parkinson's-like syndrome? If you just looked at the chemical compound structure of that, it was almost identical to the chemical compound structure of Paraquat. So they started to do more and more research and sure enough, uh, they found that it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it induces a loss of these dopaminergic neurons in rats, and sure enough, when you went out and looked at people who were exposed, they had a much higher chance of getting Parkinson's. This brings us to a very important point, which is they also found that exposure to Paraquat had something called a synergistic effect. And what that means is when people were exposed to Paraquat, in addition to one or two other exposures, the first one is iron, and the next one is something called Maneb, which is a fungicide that's often used next to Paraquat. These people had a very, very high exposure rate. So that gets us thinking that maybe what we're looking at here is not one chemical exposure, but how multiple chemical exposures are coming together. Okay, it's a really, really important point. Paraquat has been banned in the European Union and in China, but not in the United States. It is very, very toxic. It kills weeds on contact. A 2006 population study that was published in the Movement Disorders Journal suggested that there is a even higher risk for men who are exposed to these pesticides, which brings in the idea of possible gender differences. Is there maybe then a secondary hormonal level that is related? Now, of course, more men tend to work in agricultural settings, probably at the time that this research study was done. So that was my first uh, criticism and I went and I looked at the study and they actually accounted for that. So the idea is at least one study tells us that men are even more likely um, to wind up being affected. The next one is something called organophosphates and these make up about 50% of the killing agents in the current pesticides that are on the market today. Um, there have been multiple studies that have shown that exposure to these chemicals increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. But here we go with one of our uh, second most important learning points, is what the research has shown is that it's not just exposure to organophosphates that causes the problem. It's when it happens in people who have a genetic mutation that is making their development of a certain enzyme not work as good in the brain. So this is what we have, basically a susceptible person who somewhere in the chemical chain is having a problem breaking something down and probably exposure to multiple chemicals in the environment. And this is really concerning, of course, for people who have wound up with PD who really feel that it is related. If you, you know you were exposed to Paraquat, for example, um, it, it probably is the case that someone else could have had the same exposure but wouldn't wind up with the PD because you had that difficulty processing a certain enzyme. So it's a really, really complex interplay. There's no easy answers here. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency did ban the residential use of organophosphates in 2001. However, it's still allowed in agricultural settings and the places that we would be most exposed to it are in our foods, in our fruits and vegetables, and also in public parks because it's still used as a way to control mosquitoes. This is really disturbing. In 2008, the US Department of Agriculture did a study and they found that uh, detectable levels of organophosphates were found. Um, they basically went to a grocery store, took a couple things out of the produce uh, area. 28% of frozen blueberries had it, 20% of celery, 27% of green beans, 17% of peaches, 8% of broccoli, and 25% of strawberries makes me so mad, had detectable levels of these pesticides. The next one we're gonna talk about are solvents. Um, there's no clear cut evidence from either the toxicology data or the epidemiology data that any specific solvent is a direct 
factor in developing PD. However, people that are exposed to multiple solvents do have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's. So when I first heard solvent, I didn't have a clear picture in my mind what that meant. That's basically like degreasers. They're really, really strong chemicals that um, they're colorless, they're non-flammable, that, that when you put them um, with um, things like fats or greases, wax, oils, tars, they're really, really good at um, cleaning it and kind of moving it away. It is very much found in things like paint thinners, detergent, and in dry cleaning. And when I get to my recommendations, my whole idea of getting my clothes dry cleaned has changed ever since looking at this data. There is one solvent that is the focus of a lot of PD research and the initials are TCE. It's called trichloroethylene um, and this is the one that they use in um, dry cleaning. They looked at studies where they had two um, identical twins and basically one was exposed to TCE and one wasn't and the people that were chronically exposed to the TCE and the years were about 8 to 33 years were um, twice as likely to develop Parkinson's than those who were not. You can be exposed to this stuff through vapors, by being on your skin, um, unfortunately by it being in your food. Um, contamination of drinking water, um, air emissions from industrial facilities, it's, it's unbelievable. There hasn't been a lot of protective gear that was offered to people up until very recently. The next one is metals. Okay, metals are um, very important. Essential minerals are very important metals that are critical for all aspects of our health, but of course, too much metal can be detrimental. Um, the two that we're just gonna talk about briefly are um, manganese and iron. The ones, uh, the group of people that we worried about for quite some time were welders because they were exposed to a lot of manganese. That's a very controversial area of research. They basically have not come down to say there is a clear exposure or there's not. Um, iron though um, is, is people who take more dietary supplements with iron by the books are statistically more likely to develop PD. Um, but this is conflicting, so I don't think you can take that one on face level. Um, we know that in pathological studies, when we look at people's brains with PD, they do have more increased levels of iron. However, there's people that have argued that maybe this is a byproduct of Parkinson's disease. The next one are things called PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. This one will really, really tick you off if you're not mad already, but they have been produced and used, um, they were produced and used from about 1930 to 1970 really, really heavily. So uh, basically in like the coolant industry, insulators, um, fluorescent lights, electrical appliances, plastics, oil lubricants for engines. These things were really, really, really common. They have been banned since 1977 by the Environmental Protection Agency, but the problem is these things have such a long half-life and they have very long range transport. So problems that happen in China are definitely getting over here through air particles. And basically what these little buggers do is they change form. So it can be in the air and then it can become um, a mist and then it can become a solid and then it can become a gas. And it basically never decomposes to something less toxic. The other thing is that there's something called bioaccumulation, which means that in a person, in fat cells, it just keeps increasing more and more and more. Um, PCBs are reportedly detectable in the blood of over 80% of Americans over the age of 50. And the idea is that this is largely due to diet. The idea is that women may also be more susceptible to this type of damage. Again, we have some concern now about maybe gender differences. Um, in monkey studies, we know that exposure to PCB produces a decrease in dopamine. Many human studies have been done um, on postmortem uh, tissues, and there's a pretty uh, clear link between PCBs and uh, Parkinson's disease. Again, the risk was very much increased in people who have different genetic variants, uh, providing another level of strong support for the gene-environment interaction. 
Um, even though they've been banned for many years, these things are still in the environment due to poorly maintained hazardous waste sites, uh, illegal or improper dumping. Um, a lot of old electrical equipment still has PCBs in it, so even like old fluorescent lights, when people are cleaning those up and dumping them, that's then releasing these PCBs into the environment. The next level, uh, next generation PCBs are flame retardants, and I think this is the point in my research where I didn't know if I should start crying or start uh, punching a pillow because I was absolutely furious. Um, and I had known about this stuff. I mean, if you listen to NPR or, you know, good science, popular media, you hear about this stuff from time to time. But A, it's unbelievable how ubiquitous it is. It's in so many things. It's basically in surface finishes. So, you know, electronics, like the cheapy kind of furniture that many of us buy because it looks good. But, you know, it's it's not that expensive. Um, clothes. Um, you know, flame retardants, of course, are very important in a way because they keep the devastation of fires from being somewhat minimized. But the price that we're all paying for them in our environment, I think, is just unbelievable. Um, many have, have not been adequately tested for safety in human beings. So what are we left with from this research? Basically, we have multiple exposures in people with multiple vulnerabilities, and when you bring those two things together, that is probably the biggest cause of chemical exposure resulting in Parkinson's disease. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about are some protective chemicals, because chemicals are good and bad, right? There's things that we do every day that bring us a high quality of life because some engineer somewhere, some chemical scientist was able to develop it and bring it to us. There has been a consistent inverse association with exposure to tobacco and not getting Parkinson's disease. And it seems to be the difference is once a smoker or never a smoker. It's not dose dependent. It's not how much did you smoke and that way you're more exposed to maybe getting PD. The idea is once a smoker, your dramatic, your risk for getting Parkinson's dramatically reduces. Um, we also know that caffeine has this very same relationship and most recently coffee um, has been consistently associated with a, a reduced risk of Parkinson's disease and again it doesn't seem to be how much coffee you drink it's just coffee drinker or non-coffee drinker and the last one are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications so this is aspirin ibuprofen things like Celebrex so all those things those chemical exposures have been shown pretty consistently to result in less Parkinson's disease so what I care about the most is how can we take this knowledge together and turn it into action? What can you walk away today from with this lecture knowing what to do different because now you have knowledge? One pet peeve I might have, you might get, you might uh, realize I have multiple pet peeves, but one of them is that I think sometimes brain doctors and brain scientists are kind of hesitant to make recommendations unless there has been a huge amount of research support for it. And by all means, the basis of this I Care For Your Brain program is evidence-based recommendations. But there's also some times where to me, for the benefit of people, you have to make some logical leaps from your informed perspective that I think would help people. So really, I'm not going on any publicly mandated guidelines here. I just kind of used my brain to figure out, okay, if I had Parkinson's and I was worried about my child or my grandchild getting it, tell me everything, bring it on. I wanna know every single thing there is to know. So through that lens, these are the things that I came up with. The thing I want you to start thinking about is reducing your exposure. Now there's things you have control over and there's things you have no control over. What you probably have the most control over is what you put into your body, okay? So this is where your diet, what you surround yourself with in your home, what you put on your body, uh, what you put into your family's body comes into play. So the very first thing I would say is that in a perfect world, you should be eating an organic vegan diet. Remember I was saying before those PCBs get caught up a lot in fat cells? 
Well, this is known in part because of Inuit populations who ate a lot of things like whale and seal. And when exposed to certain contaminated waters, they have dramatically increased levels of Parkinson's disease in these communities. Fat cells are also found in other animal products and in dairy products. So I want you to take from that any change that you feel that is reasonable. For some people, becoming a vegan, eating all organic, that might not be reasonable. I'm a, I'm a big one for realism. You have to accept reality on reality's terms and do what is reasonable. But at least knowing that, even if you made small changes, you would be better off than not making the changes at all. The number one exposure to those PCBs is fish, especially when they come from contaminated waterways. Things that are considered sports fish are, are thought to be the worst. You really have to be mindful of what it is you put in your body, okay? The next one is learning to love weeds. What's wrong with weeds? Why are we so obsessed with no weeds? Reducing your exposure to pesticides should maybe not be as hard as we sometimes think it should be, okay? Weeds can be beautiful. Sometimes I'll put weeds in a vase and look at them and appreciate them because they're unique and I love the idea that People might think that they're a pest or a nuisance, but the form is beautiful or it's such an interesting color. I would absolutely not use pesticides in my home if I had a family uh, exposure to PD. And in fact, after a result of this, believe me, I'm gonna be making big changes in my life. Um, but really learning to appreciate that things don't have to be perfect, perfect. Pesticides, things like that. Try to reduce your exposure. Um, Staying away from flame retardants is now a huge priority for me with my family. There's so many articles associating it with cancer, it's really disturbing. So one kind of funny recommendation is buy antiques. Try to avoid all this new junk that they're trying to sell us. Um, you know, I don't wanna name any stores, but there's certainly some big box stores where you could go in there and spend $100 and come out with every single thing covered in a flame retardant, okay? So buying antiques, buying things that you know have not gone through a major manufacturing process would probably be a good idea. I would take that little tidbit about iron and probably switch to a multivitamin if you felt like you needed one that doesn't have iron. That's a recommendation that we sometimes make with Alzheimer's disease too. The next one is to protect your skin. This is our largest organ. If you are a parent, you understand uh, flame retardant pajamas, right? This is like this big thing that you would be so remiss if you didn't put your baby in flame retardant pajamas. You know, what if there was a fire? They were, you're gonna be more susceptible to burning up. Well, uh, what about the dangers of what these chemicals are doing that are making it flame retardant? So the idea is to try to use natural fibers on your body as much as you can. There are over 8,000 chemicals that get put into clothes. The idea is that things like cotton are much more likely to be free of these retardants. Anything that has a proof in it, like waterproof, perspiration proof, chlorine resistant, easy care, wrinkle free, water repellent, all of those things are going to have flame retardants. Things like formaldehyde are unbelievably common in these products. So where do we wind up? What is the future? Clearly we have a lot of outrage. We have to know how to channel that energy properly. The best thing we can do is make choices for ourselves. So much of this information has come to us through publicly funded science um, that is really being threatened right now. It's, it's a pretty scary state of affairs if you are a researcher. Supporting your federal scientific foundations is a very, very important uh, first step. When I was trying to think about the solution to this problem in the big picture, I was kind of dreaming last night and I thought, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be really the right thing to do if we did do genetic testing on folks to figure out what are their genetic mutations? So not the ones that it's the 10% where you're guaranteed you're gonna get PD. What about the 90% where you could know okay, this is my susceptibility factor. And then what if you got counseling based on all this research that was personalized knowledge that then empowered you and your family to stay away from certain exposures that might turn on these genes. The fact that we aren't having these conversations, not applying what it is we know in these research articles 
really, really, really makes me upset. And the best thing that I can do is try to bring this information to you directly. Ah, okay, so if this was interesting to you, you can go back and check out our last lecture on PD, which was 10 differences between young onset and older onset and um, non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. What we're gonna talk about next week is a chronic autoimmune movement, uh, neuromuscular disorder, pardon me, called myasthenia gravis. And that was a request from one of our new friends. So if you have a topic that you would like me to cover, I would be more than happy to. Please write that in the comments. The lecture after myasthenia gravis is actually gonna be getting back to essential tremor. And what I wanna do is take 10 questions from you guys that I would like to answer. We had so many people reach out to us about that video. There's so many people who are diagnosed with essential tremor that have so many important questions that need to be answered. So if that population is important to you, again, please write in the comments below. I do have a website in addition to this Facebook stuff called icareforyourbrain.com. Um, there's going to be a lot of new things happening on it in 2018. We're in what we call Dreaming December, where we're trying to think about what the next year is going to bring. We're talking about maybe a podcast, um, doing some webinars, but really the the most important thing to me is to stay strong to our values of sharing high quality information with as many people as we can. So what you can do to help us out is to share this video with as many people as you can because I really feel that this is a public health issue. We have to be having these conversations. When you look at the incidence of all dementias, all brain health issues, they're going through the roof. It has to be due in part to environmental exposure, okay? And we have to find out why, and we have to protect ourselves and our family. So the first step is this knowledge. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye.